Well, in Buddhism, equanimity is uh, one of the four radiances. So there's kind of two ways you can get to an experience of equanimity. One is through getting hold of the idea of equanimity, I suppose, and thinking it's a good idea, and then trying to impose it on yourself through controlling yourself. So when you don't feel economist, when you feel angry about something, or you feel irritated, or restless, or anxious, you just control yourself and create a certain semblance of equanimity in a sense, if that makes any sense, in the English sense of the word, always being nice and never showing too many extreme fluctuations in emotion. There's the stoic stance, the stiff upper lip, that's one kind of equanimity. And the equanimity that's been spoken of in Buddhism is a little bit more profound. So the equanimity that's spoken of in Buddhism comes about as a result of recognizing that all circumstances, all things that arise in the world are not me, not mine, including the mental and emotional patterns that pass through awareness. So then the awareness has different characteristics. You can talk about awareness in many different ways. There's many, many faceted. And one of its qualities is radiance, luminosity. It has a quality of light. And um, you may think we're already getting into sort of... Um, outlandish stuff. This is an out- we've already begun to get a bit outlandish, but it's not that outlandish. We all have this luminosity within us. And sometimes, just drinking a cup of coffee, you can feel it sometimes. Your mind brightens a little bit. But, uh, but it can get a lot brighter than that and a lot clearer than that. So when this, uh, this luminosity then, this quality of awakefulness always arises in Buddhism as a, as a result of being in relationship or being in touch with reality and being in touch with what's real. If you get in touch with what's real, your mind will start to wake up, start to become luminous. And if your mind becomes luminous, see reality. Normally then we're not economists because we're sort of caught in emotion. So let's talk about emotion then because sort of emotion is what happens when our feeling body is locked into a small room with our thinking mind. So when our speech mind and our feeling body are locked into this little small room that we crawl into in order to try and create a safe place to be, that's what we're up to a lot of the time, um, our emotions can become inflamed or distorted if we feel under threat or if things don't go our way or if we're feeling uh, or feel we really want something that's going to make us feel safer or more complete. You know, our emotions can get caught up in that. And they're always conjoined with this sense of me and mine and this story, this melodrama about me and mine. But as you begin to connect with reality, the flow of impermanence that's here and now, the mind begins to wake up. It is the thinking mind begins to wake up and we can contemplate things intelligently. But the feeling body begins to wake up or the emotional body begins to wake up. And the emotional body transforms into a feeling body. It goes from being emotional and self-referencing into a feeling body that's intelligently connected to the way things are. And so it begins to, we begin to release ourselves from being so um, susceptible to getting inflamed by circumstance and situation because we are no longer reading life in terms of me and mine, self and other possessions and things and getting our deriving our sense of fulfillment and security from that group entering into a completely different way of being and that different way of being is deriving our sense of security and fulfillment from the Dhamma from from the truth itself and that because it is based on reality and is more real starts to become an unshakable and an immovable direction that we're going in because there's a recognition this is true this is real this is the fulfillment of my potential. And so the emotional body then that is usually fearful and contracted around fear starts to become much more expanded. And the first of the qualities of that expansion that expressed through the realization of radiance is, is meta as this quality of loving kindness. It's a quality of loving kindness that is uncontrived. It's not self-generated, so you can't you can't decide it's a good idea and then just make it happen. You ha- it has to be born of realization. You can magnify it through coming into alignment with it, but you can't manufacture it. 
and you can't, in a sense, control it because it's a force of nature that already is, anyway. So then that, that is one expression of those four radiances, loving kindness. Then there's uh, compassion, sympathy, you know, and then sympathetic joy for the happiness or the flourishment that's happening for other people, for others. And then finally, the last of those four radiances is equanimity. It's, it's the deepest in a sense and the most profound because, because the heart then is no longer shaped by circumstance. See what I'm saying? It's no longer changes in conditions, changes in states are arising within this luminous, awakened state of mind. They're understood in the context of this luminosity, but they're not shaping, conditioning the luminosity anymore. Therefore, the heart remains unmoved in, in a natural way. So just as you begin to then unpick the seeming solidity of this body-mind, because normally we, 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 just, uh, we assume we are the body, and we assume other people are somehow associated with the body, as you begin to inquire and look into it and realize this intrinsic luminosity, in which the body is arising, then you are able to then begin to see the intrinsic luminosity and other seemingly solid things as well. And so you also get this sense of communion or coming into union with all things. So the, the impression of appearances becomes much less intimidating. And an impression of appearances, whether good or bad, becomes in a sense a source of uh, unconditional joy, unconditional aliveness, because they all are of this one taste, if that makes any sense. And so this is really what equanimity, in its deepest sense, is about. And it, and it comes about as a result of going from, let's just start at the beginning, going from the seemingly opaque density of our thinking, emotional mind, breaking that down through coming into alignment with the way things are. The way things are is inherently uncertain, difficult, uncomfortable to a certain extent, but as we accept that that is the case, then the mind brightens and awakens, and as the mind brightens and awakens, all these other things start to become accessible to us, and we understand that we are now inclining on a path of freedom that will eventually, inevitably result in complete letting go of erroneous identification and misunderstanding and misreading of what and who we are. So were there any other questions? I was a student and I, I, know, I know nothing at all about, really about Buddhism. Hmm. So you're a Thai forest. Well, I was, I was involved with the Thai forest tradition, yeah. What does that, what does that entail as distinct from any other type of... Well, um, it's the tradition that is most close, most similar to the er very early Buddhist lifestyle. So they wear the same kind of robes as the Buddha did, and they follow the same rules as the very, very early community. And they pretty much reflect on and use the most the earliest teachings before um, before they were, in a sense, influenced by other cultural um, sort of uh, input, like the Tibetan tradition incorporated much a lot from the Bon tradition. The the you know, Chinese Buddhism ha had um, been influenced by Chinese philosophy and Confucius philosophy of various sorts. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. I'm not saying that Theravada is pure. I'm just saying that um, you know it, it is this earliest form of the tradition, and in many ways it's the least kind of rock and roll, the least glamorous. But I think it's often. Theravada Buddhism is often underestimated because there is actually a seeming simplicity to the core teachings and because we are, I think, by tendency rather enamored by complexity we quite easily push them aside and, and look for things that are more philosophically satisfying without recognizing that these key teachings are really pointing out instructions that we're trying to teach us to incorporate those simple ideas and begin to reflect on them, contemplate on them in our own lives. 
which is a form of translation. So you're, you're really learning to translate these simple ideas into direct experience. And that's not actually something we're used to. We're more used to uh, giving our authority away, giving our power away to the ideas themselves without actually necessarily knowing what the ideas mean in truth. It just, they, just, they make sense to us intellectually, but we haven't seen for ourselves whether or not they're actually true. So I think there is a power to the forest tradition and to the Theravada tradition in that it does keep re-emphasizing the fact that there is this access point that will give you traction to actually realistically get going. You know, for example, the teaching on impermanence is a simple idea. You could take that one idea, and if you reflected on it for the whole of your life, it could take you to com complete liberation, complete enlightenment, if you could actually understood what it meant. Now, you can carry that idea with you very simply. It's not high philosophy, but you have to do the work of actually bringing it alive. You know, you add the yeast through your own effort, and then it begins to, to, to rise. Get something like that. Sure, but that's all of that's fine. And as you say, fake it until you make it is it's, it's a principle. It's a good principle. You know, you're acting as if when you're sitting meditating, you're acting as if we're enlightened, aren't we? Except we're not. We're acting as if we're completely content and and, and free from the impulse to modify or change our experience because everything is fine in this moment. But it isn't. But what it does is it does throw up what gets in the way. So. You know, when you practice or attempt to practice meta meditation, you may find that actually you get irritated, you get full of doubt, you get frustrated, you get heavy on yourself for not being able to make it. All sorts of things can start happening. So the intent or the effort you make to try and practice that and the failure to reach your goal can actually bring up the very things that are obstructing understanding meta for real, for entering into that luminosity of mind for real so you will be faced of, if you try to do meta meditation with a certain amount of opaqueness and non-luminosity and self-doubt and kind of you know kind of how do I get it to work whatever and, and that's what it's supposed to do and so but then you're just beginning to become familiar then with the what, what what's happening for you for real in a sense and there's no harm in that and whatever is happening for you for real if you can accord with that and not fight it and not get not create a drama over it, but kanti paramang tapotitika, the patiently bearing with, patiently enduring. This is really absolute, absolute nub in the end of what the Buddha taught. It's the patiently enduring state of mind that is far removed from being in a state of loving kindness. The patiently enduring that is in, is in a sense already acting as if you have loving kindness for whatever it is that's arising. It's just you don't feel it, you don't realize it yet. But you're creating the conditions for it to come about in the future. And that's why meditation is called cultivation. In Buddhism the word bhavana means to cultivate, whereas when we use the word meditation we think about states. We think meditation is about being in a state, whereas Buddhist meditation is about cultivating the skill of cultivation is that you've got to understand you've got it's like a garden it's got all sorts of potential and it's got the seeds are already in the ground but because you're not familiar you've not ever thought of it as a garden and you've probably not made a conscious effort to cultivate it you may have haphazardly cultivated some things and things some things may be growing but you more likely than not not entirely clear about what tools are in the garden shed, how they all work, how the seasons change, you know, and how to actually make it all flourish. That's what this is about. It's about basically getting clear about how everything flourishes. So, you know, when you actually step into the garden and start looking at it, you're going to discover there's all sorts of weeds and dead bits and tools that you've never seen before that look mysterious and not quite sure what they do. And you just start poking about and see what happens. And you learn that way. Yeah, I knew what was going on. I guess that's what happens in that. Well, I mean, I, I don't know what I can say where we'll go with this, but I'll first of all, kick off by saying 
you know, the jhanas is not something that we hardly ever talked about in the Western monasteries. It's a path. There are two paths. It's almost like the front and back of the hand. One is, is the sort of path of inquiry yeah. and looking into things that brings you or draws you into an awakened state, quality of luminosity, clear seeing, understanding. Yeah. Or the other path, which is the path of jhana, which most Westerners aren't really suited to for various reasons, partly because we're emotionally, psychically, psychologically quite ungrounded already, is the path of, um, in a sense, almost generating this quality of luminosity of mind as an absorption, absorbing into that, and then turning that towards the experience of body-mind world and investigating it from an awakened place. So they both, in a sense, converge in the same point. They both converge on being the knowing, in a sense, or being centered in a quality of awakeness that is grounded and rooted in um, inquiry into the experience of a life as is. And that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is the seeing through, continuously seeing through the apparent sense of limitation or, or imprisonment or, or imperfection and recognizing the perfection and the, the freedom in that appearance. So, so it always has this penetrative quality, and and but that's the head. That's the head part, and the heart part is a sense, is a feeling of being in a state of intimate communion with the existence. Okay, but the way to get orientated and anchored is, I mean, you can have all people can have all sorts of experiences, and they're basically, you know, they have a certain amount of value, but certainly the memory of them is worthless. And um, you know the 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 main thing is to get grounded in the in the path. So you put down proper roots, and uh, not to get too excited. I'm not saying that this is happening to you, but not to get too excited or distracted by amazing or remarkable experiences. The key is always the four foundations of mindfulness, and it's very very concrete. You know, because we can have a certain amount of psychological wounding or psychological pain. We can generate refined states of mind that can be very attractive, can have all sorts of seemingly spiritual qualities to them, but can result in us splitting off or becoming dissociated from our humanness. And if that happens, then you know, inevitably we will become, to a certain extent, disorientated because we are not trying to become as if we were gods or angels or ascended beings or any of that stuff. In Buddhist tradition we're trying to become fully awake human beings, or in Union psychology they call it ego self axis, so that your little self, your egoic self, your conventional self, your scared self, your needy self comes into alignment with your awakened self. And, but they're in axis, they remain connected. They're not disjointed. One split off from the other and so the key to this then is to working with the breath and working with the foundations of mindfulness and the first foundation of mindfulness is the contemplation of the body and the th no not necessarily death no the parts 32 parts of the body hair of the head na this traditional formula is hair of the head nails teeth skin heart you know the, the heart feels like this the lungs feel like this the skeleton feels like this the blood feels like this you know, you're beginning to... Because the body is the thing that scares the hell out of us. This is the thing... Th this thing that we think defines who and what we are is the thing we're most scared of. Because it's, you know, it's a bunch of organs and flesh and bones and blood. It's, it's not a very secure kind of uh, environment, if you really sense into it. So it kind of puts us into a state of shock when we've got a body. And we kind of go into an abstraction as a way of dealing with it, to create a sense of me and mine as a sort of safe and secure entity. So becoming grounded then always involves coming back down into the body to go to the thing that scares us most. I mean, the Buddha made it clear. I think it's the first, very first stanza in the Dhammapada. He says, you know, it's this fathom-long body, which is, you don't understand. Understand this, you understand everything. So 
I, I think he said it much better than that. But, um, so that that's a kind of summary of what I said. And um, yeah, so then this contemplation starts to, to synchronize our thinking minds with what's actually here. Yeah, well, it really, really, you, you know, you're pointing towards the, the organs the, and the body, you know, when you're, you're doing this all with mindfulness of breathing, okay? So you, your body is starting to wake up. Your body will start to wake up. You know, the energy within your body will start to wake up. The awareness, the consciousness within your body will start to wake up. The pain in your body will start to wake up. The pleasure in the body will start to wake up but it will be grounded in the body and and this in a sense is what keeps us orientated so then as the mind starts to become more bright more luminous uh, and it's integrated the emotional content you know so your feeling body then be connects with the world because if you don't integrate the emotional content which you get to through doing this work of reconnecting with the body, then you can split off without that feeling intelligence. And if you don't have that feeling intelligence, you can get very scared, if that makes any sense. Now, the other thing you've got to bear in mind, which is very common, and you mentioned the pain, and this is a tricky area, is that there's a lot of trauma in Western culture, a lot of trauma. And that trauma is very intense. It's an emotional trauma and it has to do with felt sense of isolation and not being well connected or embedded in family and in supportive human connected environment. And you can't really address that in isolation. You can't really address that by yourself very easily. I mean, you can never say never. But you've got to remember and bear in mind how difficult trauma can be because it, it, it's like a extreme contraction of our physical sensitivity and it can require a certain amount of help or skill or patience and time to shake that free to get to work through that because without that we can't really settle because as the body starts to wake up and as we start to become more sensitive to what's there we meet this wall that's very, very dense and very, very intense of resistance. It's like, no matter how hard we try, we can't get through it. And that's where you maybe have to consider learning. I mean, there's a lot of skilled people in that whole area, but you have to learn about it and work out whether or not it's applicable to you or is an influence in your life. It's obviously too much to address here. But what you're describing is feeling you were describing, you were having these sort of states of joy, states of bliss, brightness of mind, but also at the same time feeling difficulty in making sense of those because they weren't resulting in a grounded appreciation with unborn of understanding of what what is, you know, which would have you a secure axis or core around which you felt you were revolving. Without that axis, you've got to have an axis, you know, and for the body, in a sense, it's the spine. The spine is very important in meditation because the spine is almost like the axis mundi. So it's important, you know, when we sit, the spine is to a certain extent fairly erect because that's where you, you know, the, as your body begins to wake up, that's where, you know, it goes all through the nerves of the spine, but it gives you that sense of being earthed and grounded something substantial and not spaced out how far down the path can we go without having to enter a kind of domestic, domestic support well that's entirely dependent on your what we call parami on the accumulated tradition called accumulated merit or transcendental virtues the, the virtues are the, the things that you've that you have cultivated that facilitate and enable awakening on understanding and ripening to happen and and no one else can really tell how ripe you are <laughs> whether ripe like a plum that's ready to drop well, you know you yeah like how how easy it is it's going to be for you to settle and to open and to 
connect with the sort of uh, factors of enlightenment, the factors of awakening. So all monasteries are then are just places that can accelerate, magnify, support the process, if that's the right thing to do. But you know, only you can ever know whether it's the right moment or the right thing to do. And only you can know whether you can make it work in the circumstances that you're confronted with. And I'm sure a lot of people can. I don't think it's a requirement to be ordained, but it perhaps can be helpful to find a lineage, to have an affiliation with a lineage, you know, and to sort of, in a sense, get swept up by the culture of that practice. But then there's this whole Advaita Vedanta thing that's going on as well, you know, where people just seem to, they say, they just spontaneously wake up. You know, I did two weeks with um, Bill Smith, and, and, and he just told me not to just to give up trying and I just woke up and I have no doubt they had a, some sort of authentic awakening experience some of them for some of them it may be complete but what the Buddhist path offers is a progressive path you know it throws down a ladder and it gives you a way of taking the next step whereas if I just say don't do anything you're already awake S- stuck until that happens to you <laughs> may not <laughs> for sure there's lots of room for splitting and dissociation you know and anger is one of the more difficult uh, sort of emotions to deal with and but also there's a, there is a place for legitimate anger and legitimate anger actually can be an expression of loving kindness you know because it comes from a place of caring you know so anger and caring are usually very closely linked very closely connected and usually underlying anything that we're angry about is a feeling of caring about something. And it's usually the anger that's the dominant thing in consciousness and the sense of caring can be completely unconscious. But if the loving kindness is authentically operative, the awareness of loving kindness or the, the, the empathy that comes from that quality of openness will be dominant, but then it doesn't necessarily mean to say that you w- will tolerate what shouldn't be tolerated, and it doesn't mean to say that you won't deploy force when force should be deployed, and it doesn't mean to say that you're just a nice person, it's just being nice is an expression of loving kindness that's just notional, I mean it's what Trumper called idiot compassion, and just being nice is what in union circles is sometimes called the masochistic position because thinking that being nice equals being loving which is what a lot of us can do means that we can become suckers to having our space invaded in ways that aren't okay that's what Kalyanamita is about so you could, I mean, that, that spiritual friendship so the people that are friends with you can keep an eye on what's going on and, and they can basically let you know how authentic or inauthentic whatever realization you think you might have is. <laughs> Especially also in if you're in a practice type of community, often the falseness or dishonesty about what's really going on for us usually gets highlighted in some in some way, usually comes to the surface at some point. And that's why practicing alone can be so dangerous or so difficult. And traditionally, you're not really allowed to practice alone until you've lived in community for many years because you need other people to watch your back. And traditionally, in Christian communities and Buddhist communities, it's four is the minimum number because two of you can collude, but it's hard to get four. If you've got four perspectives, usually somebody's going to see if there's bullshit happening. On the same sort of topic, I don't well, there's a guy, a famous um, psychologist or psychiatrist, so some sort of, you know, a psycho guy called Winnicott, who um, <laughs> Winnicott is a psycho. Winnicott is a psycho, and um, you know, he said, until we find a moral alternative for war, there will always be wars. So, this quality of being passionate about something and protective of something or attacking something to destroy it, it can be targeted in very legitimate and wise ways. And, you know, I used the word bullshit earlier, but I wasn't joking because, you know, one thing 
that's an unfortunate result not being away. It's not having a very good bullshit detector. We put up with bullshit. We're surrounded by it, actually, all of the time. But if we can't detect it, then we don't, we, you know, we just go along with it or collude with it. And we don't confront it in a constructive way when it needs to be confronted. And so that's where anger goes inwards, you know, because there's no, we haven't found a legitimate channel or a legitimate way of expressing that very powerful force of nature that exists within us and has potentially a very useful function. So that, if that makes any sense. But I'm trying so to marry that with what Yeah, well, anger burns us up when we've not got a legitimate way of, of, of embodying it and giving expression to it. You know, or when, because you know, and because the thing th that is truly worth fighting for, and that we are all, I believe, wired, hardwired to fight for, is the truth. Uh, but you have to know what the truth is before you can protect it. It's like the Guardian. You've seen in, it, in the British Muse in, in Edinburgh and the museum. They've got these amazing incredibly powerful looking warriors that used to stand at the temple door. They're statues, like they're massive and they're holding big swords and they look incredibly scary. And they're standing at the door of the temple. And that is the right image, the right metaphor for what that, you know, the good warrior, the good soldier serves the king and the queen or serves that which is true. Whereas the mercenary is self-serving. Okay, so when that anger is used in a self-serving way, it becomes highly destructive. When that anger is aligned with true principle, it transcends the self and it protects what's actually worthy of being protecting. And it will dare to do it as well and it will bring about very positive results when it's deployed, whereas the unskilled warrior the, or the immature person will either turn it on themselves or turn it on others in a way that results in confusion or damage or destruction that doesn't make any sense, that is senseless. So what does the warrior do? I mean, the, there's warrior imagery in quite a lot of the traditions. In the Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist tradition, they have the idea of the sword, so it's got to do with discernment. It cuts through, you know, so we're swimming in, we're swimming in partial bullshit and partial truths all of the time. And thing is to be able to be clear enough to cut through what's true and what's false and to not let the false interfere with the true. And we have this imagery, it runs all through our culture, I mean, and the British are actually quite good at it. But think about it, I mean, is, don't, didn't you wonder, when Princess Diana died, did, it, did you not wonder why her body was carried on the back of a gun carriage, surrounded by soldiers? <laughs> Metaphorically, you see, that's an expression of what's true, because she represents, in a sense, the princess, the connection with the heavens. She is an expression of that. She's supposed to be an expression of that purity, that sensitivity, that caring, and the soldiers protect her and serve her, transcend their self-interest and serve that goodness and protect it. And that is why Princess Diana's body was carried on the back of a gun carriage. And it felt right, it felt good, it was powerful as a metaphor, as an image. But going back then to, um, so just to the thing of kind of felt anger mm. and how to direct it yeah. in a more kind of everyday way, I guess, like what would you advise me to Well, I mean, it's funny it comes up today because I actually had an incident, <laughs> quite a bad one, <laughs> with a bus driver who'd was going back to kick in my windscreen, I think. So, I mean, you know, sometimes... You, you, I mean, first of all, you don't want to be too scared of it because it can throw you into situations that feel dangerous. You know, if you, you deal with something you just and you don't know what's going to happen. Like there was a guy once who set up... It was in a residential area, and he decided to use his garage to start making garden furniture. So he had this big circular saw right outside my office. It was completely illegal. And he'd been asked to stop, but he was just like churning out this stuff and the saw was going all day and I couldn't work. And, you know, normally I'm a restrained sort of proper English, not that I'm English, but, you know, Brit. 
like everyone else. But for some reason, it just I reached a point where I couldn't stand it anymore, and I jumped out the window. <laughs> And he was standing there, and I just said, you, you know, stop making that bloody noise. It's driving me absolutely, you know. And it was scary because I had no idea what was going to happen. You know, you could have swung an axe and taken my head off. I, I had no idea. And I think he was a bit sort of taken aback. And he shouted at me, you know, you bloody privileged person, you know, you've no idea what we have to put up with, you know, don't tell me what to do. And it was just like, and gradually we, things calmed down and um, we ended up having quite a nice chat. And I, next day I took, took him a bottle of wine and apologized and everything in it. And it all worked through, you know. But when you really... The whole thing about the warrior is fearlessness and being able to step into situations that are scary and then f feel that you have the competence and the, and the ability to survive constructively, but you're also willing to do what is necessary to bring about a result that's required for the benefit of the community, for the benefit of everybody. To get back to your question, and when it comes to this, this, you know, it's a passion and it's a very powerful one and it can be dangerous and destructive. So you have to get familiar with it. And one of the principles, obviously, is restraint, but conscious restraint, not repressive or suppressive restraint, but the willingness just to, to feel the discomfort of that without knowing what's best, but to not resist the discomfort. It's a painful feeling that needs to that we need to, in some sense, get familiar with. And the more familiar we, will, we get with it, the more intelligence, feeling intelligence, will get released that will give rise to better and better results when we do have to deploy that force. But a lot of the problems in the world are because we are afraid of this force, this anger. We won't you know, pretend we don't have it, so we don't act. So the idea of acting and, 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 and what we're calling anger are closely connected. It's to do with action, an action that brings about change, born of discernment. Now you say, you know, you're in a board meeting and they're, you know, they're talking about maybe, you know, bundling assets that you know are, are bad assets and selling them on or something, and instead of putting up with it, you stand up and say, this is not okay. I'm not going to let you get away with this. You take it on. You take on the fight. Whereas if you just like a nice person, you pretend you don't take it on, you know, and so the change doesn't happen. So we need more people who can develop a mature appreciation of how, you know, to use this force of nature accurately. There's lots of imagery for it. The whole mythology around Camelot and the drawing of the sword from the stone is that in our culture, and then the Vikings had this saying, never give a man a sword unless he's learned how to dance. So the implication is you've got to have a kind of feeling sensitivity, an emotional, not only so much an emotional sensitivity, but a feeling sensitivity, a heart, a quality of wholeheartedness before you can responsibly use that sort of a power. You can before you can responsibly hold a sword and, and swing it. So you you know because otherwise you might swing that sword for selfish reasons because <laughs> you just feel irritated or afraid. No. People who specialize in trauma. I mean, we, we were our community was lucky enough to have a connection with Franklin Sills up at the Corona Institute, and he's a good friend of a. Man, I think his name is called Peter Levine, and he's written books about trauma. He, yeah, so I guess we were quite informed about that. I recently came across a whole other, <coughs> an Italian guy who's got a way of working with trauma as well. I, I don't know too much about it, but there's a lot of expertise and knowledge out there now, and it's, it's quite well understood. <coughs> Our community pinpointed it as being an issue that's quite prevalent amongst Westerners just because of the dis sort of emotional dysfunctionality of our families. Authentic, uh, grounded spiritual growth, yes, because what can happen is people have an, un an unconscious agenda. Well, they hear Buddhism is about suffering and the cessation of suffering, so I'm going to become a Buddhist and just get away from this suffering. 
not necessarily consciously or you know simplistically is that but then they start meditating basically what they're trying to do is just like take off like a space rocket and get out of here <laughs> because the world is a shithole anyway I mean that's what the Buddha said you know he said it's impermanent and suffering and you know so it becomes we used to call it necrophilia it becomes a form of you know loving death in a sense you 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 this world that is such a source of pain you define as being dead and and you take delight in the deadness of it and that you, you can depart through ascending to a higher state of consciousness. But it's just another way of interpreting the teaching. It's just unfortunately not what the teaching is pointing to. I mean, there is no teaching that's not misappropriated. They all lend themselves to that. Don't worry, don't... Yeah... You sound like I used sounded because I was always going to my teachers saying, "Well, what about this? Everyone's seen this. What about this? Everyone's seen that." They kept saying, D "Just stop thinking about what other people are doing and take care of yourself. <laughs> Don't worry about others. You know, make it work for you. And if you can make it work for you, then you'll be able to help others make it work for others. You kind of become a kind of a, you know, someone who, in a sense, templates it properly." Yeah, I mean, it's a minefield. It's a minefield. But do you know what the Buddha said? I teach this teaching so you become independent in the teacher's dispensation. So, you know, you become a light unto yourself, you, in a sense. And, and this is what it's about. It's about self-empowerment. Taking authority for your own process, your own growing maturity and, and clarity and stillness and well-being. So you gradually become less and less prone to being intimidated or being thrown into doubt by others. Now, do you know what the word religion means? No question. Well, maybe you do. You said you were a geek. <laughs> it means to, it comes from the Latin religio, which means to bind back or reconnect. The true meaning of what religion is, is that there basically there's a reality, a truth we've become dissociated from, and we're reconnecting to it. We're coming back into attunement with that. And that's all it is. So you can call it religion or call it whatever you like, but if you think there's a principle of a reality that we've become separated from and that we can attune to again, then that's religion and that's enlightenment. But that's just a, one way of describing it. Don't a lot of people say that Buddhism isn't a religion? Yeah, but it's just like, you know... It's like, is it a tomato a vegetable, or is it a, or 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 is it a fruit? <laughs> Assumption that was a higher being. No, well, yeah, no. I mean, it's it's a word that we have, you know, we've not really. It's not it's not a word we haven't really made the effort to understand properly, you know. So we just go along with what the whole kind of accepted cultural norm is, and we think, well, religion means. God and churches and ritual and believing. Most people think religion means believing because they haven't actually considered that there's a whole other possibility. They may not know that there's another possibility, but that's just the sort of word on the street, isn't it? But that's not actually what the word religion means. And, no. and so, as I'm saying, the word religion means to reconnect. So if you go back to the true meaning of what it means, that's, in my mind, most helpful. So one of the ways you can approach the process of reconnecting is through following a theistic approach or theistic structure where the pointing out instructions, pointing out of how it's done or how it's experienced or what to look for is couched in theistic terms. You know, they use, you know, they talk about God and they talk about, you know, the Son of God or whatever. Or That's a structure, it's a theistic structure, whereas Buddhism is a psychological structure. It's just a different way of structuring it. So, for want of keeping it simple, I would say Buddhism is a religion, Christianity is a religion, Islam is a religion. They're all religions in the sense that they're all trying to facilitate a reconnecting with reality and a direct knowing of it. But they are exclusive, they're mutually exclusive. So you couldn't be a Buddhist and a Christian? Or could you? Well, I think you could. Sort of I think from the perspective of, of understanding yeah. or being rooted in not in belief, not in doctrine, not in dogma anymore, but in direct mm -hmm. 
knowing, then you can you can look at all of those traditions and you can reflect on your own experience and see how it actually makes sense in the light of that awareness. Be enlightened and be a Christian or whatever. Yeah, I mean, in in in, in this tradition, we have the idea of it just being a raft. It's a raft you use from getting to get from this shore to the other shore. But once you get to the other shore, you don't pull the raft out of the water, strap it onto your back and carry it around with you. Once you've got to the other shore and you're standing on solid ground, you just walk, walk away from it. But if someone else is stuck on the other shore, you can push the raft over and say, look, there's a raft, get on it like this, row it like this. And when you, well, if you keep rowing it in this direction, you'll actually get to where I am. Yeah, but as I've often said, that's like the finger pointing to the moon. You're mistaking yeah. the finger pointing to the moon for the moon. Yes, called quite. Yes. yes. Quite, yeah. Which is just um, an unfortunate... Well, well, it's belief, isn't it? Yeah. You're mistaking, you're believing in something that you don't know. Yeah. But you take refuge in the belief. Yeah. And beliefs can make you feel better. You know, I could say you're going to win the lottery tomorrow. If you believe that, you're going to feel quite excited, maybe. <laughs> yeah, there. I mean, there. There are different um, paths. You've got the path of belief, which is the slowest path of faith. I can't remember which is the slowest. I think maybe faith is the slowest. Then it's belief, and then the path of wisdom, which is the royal road. It's the fast one. But Buddhism provides for people who only wish to work with belief can provide for that. They may keep pointing out that there's a next step if they want to take it, but it's, it doesn't deny there's a place for that. So there are people who just you know, believe in the power of the Sangha, believe in the power of giving, believe in the power that of, of the Buddha, and that if they give, they, they will be recipient of the blessings of the Buddha. They can interpret it in that way can be a little bit childish, but actually it's not entirely untrue. That generosity is acting as if your heart is you know, open in a mature way and, and trusting that the Buddha is a wise person that brings blessing power, has a blessing power. Well, that's not entirely untrue either because if you see the Buddha, you see the Dhamma and the Dhamma blesses and is a blessing. You know, so their, their beliefs... You can experience that for yourself, so... Necessarily be fair. You can experience that. Yeah. Then. Benefit, but you in this. Karma. And. And reincarnation. Yeah. All right, you. That's we're moving into another subject here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Sorry. I was just thinking the elements of Buddhism that are about faith. It's not as if it's without faith. And when I say faith, I mean believing in something that you've not. Been the touch. word faith in Buddhism is sada. And the word sada means to give your heart over to, or to entrust your heart. I always get this image like a bird bursting out of a cage. Just you entrusting your heart to the rawness of existence as it is. And in, in that sense, in that w way of interpreting it, it doesn't have the connotation of a belief. It has the connotation of a coming into alignment with something and trusting it. And feeling met in some way by something that is trustworthy which is what Tathagata means it means the one that comes towards or in Christian terms you could say grace and when you're met by that for real you entrust yourself to it but this is leading into a whole other huge <laughs> territory so I just want to say you know belief is not invalid and um, it has its place, but the more mature sort of next step is is the translating of that belief into the seeing of the thing you believe in directly for yourself. People who take refuge solely in belief get caught, or basically fundamentalists, that's what it is, because they can't afford for things to be anything other than this one way, because without the belief they have nothing. They certainly don't have a realization that isn't... Um, modified or destroyed or shaken by a belief being challenged. See, if someone comes to me and says, well, I am a such and such, I follow, I follow the Lord, and that's the only true way, and, you know, the Buddhists, you're, you're a Buddhist and you're 
on a deviant path. It's the work of the devil or whatever. It doesn't bother me in the slightest because Buddhism is just a convention. The realization that you can come to as a result of using that convention has nothing to do with Buddhism. It's just that because you learn how to use a particular convention, a particular vehicle, you know how to drive that car. That's the one that you encourage others to drive. But it's the destination that's the point. The vehicle is completely secondary to that.